Human beings are social animals. Our lives depend on other humans. We develop and learn about the world around us through the filter of other people. Our connections to each other are key to not only our survival, but also to our happiness and the success of our careers. Human beings are really hardwired, believed to to get feedback from each other. One of the reasons social media is so prominent is because uh, as humans, we want to share the experiences that we live together. So when I was first introduced to computers, social media immediately became something that I had to deal with and encounter. In fact, it was sort of the draw to the computer. Nobody really knew how to, how to do any of it. When I began and Twitter began, I remember someone saying to me, there's this, there's this thing called Twitter. Publishing. And I just added this real-time aspect, an SMS aspect, and we said, what if, with just SMS on the web, I can re go anywhere I want and report what I'm doing and then see what everyone else is doing in real time? Very, very simple start. And the users have taken it from there. Watertown, Massachusetts, Mark Zuckerberg, creative, creator of Harvard's thefacebook.com. Mark, if somebody was to put the question to you about the, the magnitude of what you think you've launched, how big do you think your product or your service is? Well, it's impossible to tell. When we first launched, we were hoping for, you know, maybe 400, 500 people. Harvard didn't have a Facebook, so that's the gap that we were trying to fill. And now we're at 100,000 people, so who knows where we're going next. If a company has a billion customers, uh -huh. how can they not be killing it making money? Well, I think it depends on your definition of killing it. I mean, we are making billions of dollars. Well, what is your definition of killing it? Well, doctors are warning about a new condition called Facebook depression. But like most things in cyberspace, there is a downside. Facebook may even be dangerous to your health. People are more isolated than ever before as social networks fail to replace human bonding. Mm, so Thanks to the incredible technological advancements made by these guys and many others, we have somehow been able to fit the standard amenities of modern life onto a 5.5 inch square of lights and circuits. Most of these things are necessary to the average functioning modern person, but what about social interaction? We as humans are social animals and thrive on the idea of sharing and being valued by others. Have we managed to fit that? feeling and that need onto this 5.5 inch screen. This is a great connecting device. It is also a great disconnecting device. So what is it doing to us? Currently the three most commonly experienced effects are the fear of missing out or FOMO, anxiety, and the impact it has on real life interaction skills. Uh, my name is Michael Quinlan, Dr. Michael Quinlan. I'm a clinical psychologist. I currently work at a private school on Long Island. As patients have told me and students have told me, one of the, the more difficult and troubling things about it is the, well, I would say the FOMO would probably be the, 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 the biggest thing that I think about. FOMO, the fear of missing out. I'm Billy, I'm 14. My life revolves around social media. I think fear of missing out, um, or, I didn't, never mind, you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Christian, I'm 16, and I think I experience fear of missing out whenever I like scroll through my Instagram feed. I personally experience FOMO the most on Snapchat. Snapchat, I yeah, knew yeah. Because yeah. everyone on, can agree with that. <laughs> on Instagram, like you know people are posting the best photos, you don't really care, but on Snapchat, it's like constantly, like 24 seven, you're being bombarded with photos and you know it's just like what's happening in their lives, yeah. more or less. Um, yeah, so I wrote an article in our school newspaper on FOMO and I 
kind of, I discuss like its negative implications for like the human brain and like especially on adolescent teens and stuff and how it can cause depression and social anxiety and stuff like that. Something is going on that they're not a part of because their focus is there. It's going to make them feel, for most, for a lot of kids, it makes them feel stressed. Chris Parrott. I'm the BPS Chartered Counseling Psychologist. Um, I'm also co-founder of a company called Yourself Series. And so Yourself Series is a teen identity development program. During, especially during adolescence, they're so focused on what's going on in their social world with other people in terms of yeah, its fear of missing out. They're, they're feeling it's, it's painful to be left out. Hence why if we're feeling that pain in the brain at this, you know, in the same place as physical like we want to avoid, we're built, we're wired to, to avoid that. With uh, people posting, you know, every aspect of their life, you know, we as human beings, we, we all want to be invited to everything. Whether we really want to go or not is another story. I think kids get anxious and some get even mildly depressed because they're not involved in that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Snapchat really goes hand in hand with like the high school experience in general mm -hmm. with everyone mm -hmm. trying to like um, show uh, kind of like validate themselves like show that they're socially mm -hmm. not like socially inept and that I totally agree that uh, Snapchat is the biggest uh, source of fear of missing out and I actually was super against Snapchat for a really long time because of that I don't really want to see you and your friends hanging out doing nothing let's say um, a big group of your friends they all go out to a restaurant and they all get delicious looking meals and you're sitting at home and you're just looking at the pictures of the meals and you're wondering you know how you would feel if you were there eating with them my name is Amanda Fisk I'm a 35 year old social media coordinator and I'm also a graphic designer and photographer as a 35 year old who's unmarried and doesn't have kids I experience FOMO by looking at Facebook you know, when you log on to Facebook and within a week there are five new babies born in your social circle, you start to question yourself. And it's unfortunate because it actually takes a minute to realize that this doesn't mean I'm in the wrong place and this doesn't mean that I should be doing something different. Facebook is showing the best of the best of what you have. Snapchat is so raw. I'm Caitlin, I'm 16, and I think social media has taken over my dance career. I mostly get FOMO or fear of missing out when parties or like house parties or get together yeah, whatever anybody wants yeah. to call them like you find out five minutes before that everybody rushes but if you're not able to get there you miss out on whatever's going on so people snapchat yeah. story them and it's kind of like it's kind of annoying because I'm like why what, like it, it's just so weird I well know. I feel like that whole fear of missing out thing has always been a part of like the high school experience of you don't want to waste these best years of your life mm -hmm. I feel right. like um, well, FOMO doesn't really affect me that much, but I know for me, like, if I'm out with friends, I always try to, like, be cautious and be, because some people could have their feelings hurt by that. As you go towards middle school, issues like bullying become a lot bigger. FOMO becomes huge because they see friends hanging out with other friends, they feel left out, they feel ignored. Uh, belongingness and affiliation is such a part of our lives that um, when we're not and we see other people doing things, it, fe it leaves us with a sort of empty feeling. I, I, to people that use it just like to put up stupid pictures and, and money and stuff like that and to make us and want attention and want other people to look at them and say, oh wow, he's living a, a crazy lifestyle. All those people, you know, they're, they're pointless in my eyes. Like, it's all, it's just, you know, I don't... To some, FOMO is as simple as realizing that, well, the grass is always greener on the other side. But to others, the constant comparison and necessity to keep up with likes and a certain lifestyle online can cause serious anxiety. Anxiety, in my mind, is, is a warning sign that something's not quite right. And generally, I think that the bombardment of um, material on the internet sometimes leaves individuals with very little time to actually decompress, relax. And I think that that by itself uh, creates a, a higher level of anxiety. Hello, I'm Richard. I'm 11, and social media isn't a part of my life at all. I don't need one, but like everyone else, everyone else is like, Oh yeah, I got it. And I'm like, I don't. <laughs>
I own it, yeah. <laughs> I follow t other things like music that doesn't involve social media, but the people that do follow social media, they kind of like get obsessed, and if they don't get like those 10 likes on that video of when they went to that NBA game, you know, they get paranoid, and I've seen that happen a lot in the game. Like if it doesn't get at least 60 likes on Instagram, I'm like, nope. Uh. <laughs> I think that's a real thing, like anxiety. Um, I think it's something that people haven't really had to deal with before. And it's just kind of weird that like, I mean everyone's, you know, putting on a performance in life. Now, back to just Jenny. I want to watch it again and again and again. Follow her at Jenny Hunt. I'm Jenny Hutt, and I have a show called Just Jenny on Sirius XM, and I talk about everything. I'm pretty much open with who I am, and I think that's something that Oprah O Magazine likes to talk about. So here I am. It's very exciting. Did Oprah follow you on Twitter? Oprah doesn't follow me on Twitter. My God, I'd love her to follow me on Twitter. But so social media, I've gotten, I've tried to get really into it. Now, frankly. I'm a little older than uh, the, sort of the, the kids who are way into social media. I'm Raquel Hutt. I'm a sophomore. Just part of my everyday routine. Wake up, check my Instagram, check my email, check my phone, check everything about everything. Jacob Hutt. I'm 17. Uh, my sister frequently hijacks my phone to, like, uh, to make sure that I like all of her photographs. But for my job, for my work, it's essential because it's how I connect to my listeners. I mean, there have been times that things have gotten a little bit out of control on social media. If I've done a, another person's show that had a different kind of following from mine and there's an onslaught of comments, just rapid fire. Sometimes I have to take a deep breath and back off, but that's okay. Tonight, social media anxiety and the pressure to be liked by getting likes on what our young people post online. But in online. a digital age, experts say, social media can sometimes cause likes anxiety based on how many people like a post. There was this one video that I posted in like the winter or whatever, and I usually only get like 300 whatever, like I shouldn't say only, but like whatever. <laughs> But I got past a thousand. I was like, oh my god, like this is, this is, I, I, I was like shaking. I was like, this is stupid. Why am I feeling this way? But I'm like, keep liking my, my video. Like, keep it up. Like, I'm like, when you have that ping that goes off, your brain actually releases um, dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain that's associated with reward. It feels good. It makes me happy. If I get a lot of her like, it makes me happy. Wow, well, like, um, sometimes it's uh, 80. 65, under something, yes, yeah. Some have even compared this sensation of likes on social media to a shot of dopamine. Post things, like I know I have one friend who's so focused on likes that she'll post a new profile picture at like, like in the afternoon, and then around like dinner, evening, she'll edit it and add the caption so that it pops up in people's news feeds a second time to get more likes on it. It's kind of sad. If I don't get those likes or that positive feedback, like, I think, what did I do? Like, did I do something wrong with this pixel? Anything it's that like... releases dopamine, we want to, we're just naturally wired to do that again. So anything that we do repeatedly, we are at risk for wiring an addiction into our brains because we are actually um, <laughs> literally wiring the brain. Literally, I, I want to ask you in like five minutes how you feel. That's not like I'm naked right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're just over here. Okay. Yeah. It's all for the likes. It's like a high. It makes you feel like people have seen what you posted. People have seen something that's a part of you, basically. The more personal the social media post, mm -hmm. the bigger the reaction is, I think, because everybody kind of wants to see inside everybody else's life. I think that a lot of people think that their likes are commensurate with their value, and I think the issue with that is that a lot of times, um, I think, or I know like for girls, um, the picture that you get the most likes on is probably something that you shouldn't be posting, or yeah. if you do post it, like, you know, like you get more respect from a picture of you, like, 
in less clothes and in more clothes, and I think it distorts people's like image of you. Exactly. You. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. When kids look at this kind of thing and they see that they're not in the same place as everyone else, they don't necessarily have the assurance of who they are to look at that and feel like that's okay. Personally, I just like every single photo on my Instagram feed or like on my Facebook feed, I'll like almost everything because it's just, I don't know, I kind of feel like a nice, I feel like I'm being nice or something, yeah. but. Yeah. <laughs> unless I actively dislike something. Yeah, unless uh -huh. I do that, there's like, and then there's I won't only like that. It. Yeah. yeah. There are times when people are vulnerable on Facebook and those seem to always have a high engagement. You know, you get a lot, you see a lot of likes, a lot of, uh, because uh, when people are honest about stuff like that, I think people really connect with it because I think you, generally speaking, have a lot of people going through shit. Everybody's really not having the best life ever. Like social media often makes you feel, so social media often makes you feel like, wow, everybody had a great day today except me. It's like, mm, well, not really. Um, it's just that the people who had good days shared them um, and the people who didn't, didn't. I need to take time to travel and spend time with my family and start my own creative ideas. So the first of those projects uh, ended up being something I called One Second Every Day. Basically, I'm recording one second of every day of my life for the rest of my life. Uh, hi, my name is Isu Kuriyama. I am the founder of One Second Every Day. This project has had such a profoundly positive impact on my life that I've passionately developed an app that will make it extraordinarily easy for anyone to do this too. One of the revelations that led to One Second Every Day, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story of mine, you know, from, from my past. Yeah. Uh, this is before I quit my job and started One Second Every Day. I remember I went to Puerto Rico back in like 2007 and I, I literally brought two suitcases with me because one suitcase was just filled with equipment. I went there for like three days and I thought to myself, why is it that I'm trying to capture this? And, I, and it's just like, so I could like post it on Facebook? I mean, what's... So, I mean, for what, you know? Like, why, why don't I just sit here and enjoy the sunset? Uh, why does it need to look good? Is it because I'm trying to be an artist and I want to get a good photograph? Is it because I'm trying to actually uh, um, just have something to share? Some people, they don't care. Uh, like uh, me, like I mean, I'm an artist, I'm a photographer, it's more important for me. It depends on the people. Some people, they don't, they don't even like, they don't even look Facebook, they don't even look Instagram. Because I remember when I first got an Instagram, like, I wouldn't like something, I'd like, I'd like things that I actually liked. And then people were like, why did you like my picture? And it became sort of this, like, I'm sorry, did I offend you or yeah. something? Like, it seems like a really bad issue of, like, you can say anything on social media these days, mm -hmm. but you can't say it all to people face to face. Yeah. Like, I'll have arguments with people on social media, but then in, like, the classroom, they won't say anything to my face. Yeah. Your students are not really connecting to each other in ways that I think are really important for them. And human interaction is messy. But that's also what makes it so vibrant and full of life and, and comforting and rich is that messiness. But, you know, we're now at this point where like we want control and I don't want to make mistakes and I can I only want to, I, uh, you know, only this much is what I'm saying. And Damage social yourself. media is really like, even amazing. with filters, I know something with just off of filters where you just ask, like, just editing your face or where you are, like to make it look a little more clear, just basically to look the best. While we focus on updating and perfecting our own online personas, we can actually end up creating sometimes fake surface relationships that are with people who we aren't actually connecting with and can be detrimental to our real life interaction skills. So do you think social media use has impacted your ability to socialize with other people face to face? Like how so? According to Forbes magazine, only 7% of communication is based on the verbal word. That means that over 90% of communication is based on nonverbal cues, such as body language, eye contact, and tone of voice. There are things we need to figure out with social media, especially from, from you know, a teenager's standpoint, where uh, you know, there, there are social cues that we all kind of developed. Uh, and uh, either they're developing later or they're not developing at all, potentially not, de not de de developing. Let's give an estimate. If I'm spending 30% less time in my life 
looking at your face and 30% more time looking at my phone, I am 30% less having less ability to read the the facial expressions that you have. I think that it's not as obvious the way it affects us, but I think it really does. Like I know so many people that if they want to like break up with someone, like that don't do it in person. And like I remember years ago when it was like like breaking up over text, that's like the worst thing you could possibly. Now it's yeah. so normal. And yeah. now it's like everyone yeah. does it. And mm -hmm. that's like kind of scary. I want to be fair to students. I think this is um, not just related to, to the internet. I don't know that we as adults or parents are as focused on uh, some of the more, how do you say, manners or things along those lines. And then you add the social media aspect of things where I've got to go check on my text while I'm talking to you. That's really created a, um, a gap in our ability to really interact well with each other. I hate it when people, when I'm talking and picture people are with their phones and taking selfies and yeah, I feel like they're not paying attention to me. There's a University of Michigan study that took a look at the development of empathy from 1979 to 2009 and they actually saw a 40% decrease in empathy happen right after 2000, which is right when social media started to come online. And the internet came in the way and uh, somebody can say something horrible to somebody and they don't see the repercussions of that and so they don't they are detached from the re from the outcomes of, of what they of the, what they say I think that um, communication online allows us to think before we send something and like redo things and like I shouldn't say this I shouldn't say what comes to mind like let me re like think about my answer and say it so sometimes I found it really interesting when I'll post something on Instagram and then a fight will break out in the comments. I don't really understand why people are getting into any sort of argument. I think I'm a history major. I think a lot about like how information used to be processed and how people used to interact with each other and people, how people used to socialize. And it's seriously mind blowing, like the amount of contact we have with each other now. This not so face value communication that we see on social media today is often a result of the exaggerated personas people desire to display online. I'm like, I look at other people, I'm like, I wish I could be like that. I'm like, I can be like that on social media. I don't it's have so to be true. like that in real life. Yeah. I definitely know people who present as incredibly happy with their lives, and in fact, they're not. <laughs> I post pictures that I think I look good in, even if it's not like with my best friend in the world, because yeah. I'm proud of the fact that I look good. I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm confident, like, hey, why not? I think what I like about Twitter is that often I, well, maybe I'm wrong, but often I believe that it's a real person. I like that it's not exactly anonymous. When you meet someone in person, a lot of times it's like a little awkward because who you portray like yourself as online is not totally um, who you can portray yourself as in person. Sometimes I look at people's pictures and they're like really nice pictures and I laugh because it's like... Well, what do you mean you by, look by like genuine that? though? Like um, genuine in terms of like they're projecting like some sort of like wealth or something. Yeah, like some sort of other. No, when people when people are like sitting and they're like, oh, oh like those stupid. I'm like, like, I'm like who yeah, took yeah, that yeah. picture? Your mom? Like, <laughs> wait, yeah. Did you have Actually, your mom yeah. when, when, take your picture? Yeah, when like people act like they're like that's models. Me. And, yeah, that's yeah. Me. yeah. And people no, are like no, with their friends funny. and they're like, I don't like neither of you two are taking that picture. So who is? Yes, what? Half and I have been like looking at each other's Instagram just to see how genuine we each are and like give each other feedback yeah. on like how we portray ourselves in uh, social media. And just knowing Catherine, Caitlin, <laughs> hold my hand if you want to feel comfortable. Okay. <laughs> she's so nice, she's been so nice every time I've seen her, whatever, she's like one of my best friends, and blah, 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 you know the deal. I noticed about your Instagram is that you post the pictures that you look best in with even if it's people that you aren't that close with. <laughs> you are probably so right. Yeah. <laughs> It's like a, it's like a, the dancing is a really accurate representation of yeah. you. I don't know, like your your Instagram is very nice. And it really it shows who you are, like your friends, all your like uh. where you go to vacation. Like I like it, and honestly, I like the the last picture that she has. It's like of a cat, and it's super corny. And I think it's like one of the reasons why I like it the most. It's like you really just don't care. Like you, but like also like something you said about that, I got like fifty. Six likes on oh, it. In, in comparison in to like, comparison like, to like the last one, which was like 160. Yeah. yeah, but like I like it because like I like your Instagram layout. Honestly, like 
just because like you don't care like in a good way like you don't care what other people think you like it for yourself it's like so funny to me when some of the instagrams like just them or it's just yeah. like a bunch of pictures of like solely them yeah not yeah, even them in a right group balance. just them and i just think that's like yeah. so bizarre i think if because like if people wouldn't be on their phone as much it would be like more human interaction like it wouldn't be as you know everybody's on the phone and everybody is focused on do you find it annoying on. well it kind of is kind kind of is annoying but i wouldn't have let it annoy me you know get mad or something that's them like you know you can't get mad you can't blame anybody so With Beam, we wanted to do something different. We wanted you to be able to maintain eye contact. We wanted you to be able to keep staring at the sunset. And we wanted you to keep watching the rock concert while still letting you share. So, this is what sharing on Beam looks like. There's no staring at the phone. You just hold it to your chest and it records. And then it's posted. That's it. And if we stick with this, the grass is always greener on the other side analogy, Beam actually gets rid of there being another side altogether because of its unaltered sharing of pure life perspective. Sure, my name is Casey Neistat and uh, I have a technology company called Beam. Beam is predicated on sharing content that's not important, just tiny little pieces of, of perspective and nothing more. You know, commenting, I think verbal commenting, uh, is something that we, we deliberately omitted. We wanted the consumption to be super casual on Beam. The, the intention with reactions, which is sending someone a photo of yourself while you're watching their content, uh, should you choose to. The idea with that is to, to let you know that what you're sharing is actually being received by a human being. Uh, and I think that a lot of behavior on social media today with like buttons and, and double clicking and things like that, you get these anonymous numbers and, and seeing what's behind that number uh, I think is, is a very interesting opportunity. You know, I don't know. I think finding that balance is easy for someone like me because I'm an adult. And I think it's extremely challenging for someone in a, a social dynamic like high school. I hope it can help. Beam is based around an idea that you know, it, it's not about how you look, Beam's not about judgment, Beam's not about making yourself uh, more beautiful with filters or anything like that. It's just about sharing things honestly uh, and sharing true perspective. Social media. I think the thing that we need to like fix most about social media is how much we like talk about it and like make it a part of our lives, like put it in our daily conversations. And if we stop that, like people will stop like thinking like, oh, I need to be on social media. Like I need to like, always be on it and be hooked to it. I think um like in terms of instagram it's fine however pictures you want to post that's your life that's your decision and uh, i'm not one to say like this number is too many but i think it's important to remember like when you are doing things for yourself and for your like life experience uh as opposed to doing things um solely for the purpose of getting them on social media and having your life be centered around like the, this digital platform how do we stop it otherwise do you even want to stop it? Just like with anything else in life, using social media has its pros and cons, and at the end of the day, it's about finding how you use it with balance and moderation. Because I think we can all agree that social media is an incredible tool that has helped us globalize our community like no other technology before it has. Now I'm here, I connect for over the world, you know, in Africa, in my country, you know, I'm here. If now, any, anywhere I am, I can connect with them. With, uh, and they know where I am, you know, is, I think it's more important. We're, we're, you know, coming from out of town, like, we have the three of us and all of my friends who live here, like, that's who's with us through our phones. Um, so it really, I think, makes the world a lot bigger and smaller. Social media is a wonderful thing. It's a great tool. Um, we should be glad that it's here. As in the case with any tool, if we don't use it properly, it can create problems. My relationships with other people and how deep they are, that's really when I get a better understanding of myself. We're missing out on what's in front of us. As a photographer, a lot of times when I go somewhere interesting, I don't want my camera with me. I don't want my smartphone with me because I want to actually have an experience. It is that it's, er it's, it's still pretty early in the social media landscape, you know, uh, with any new thing we we have to figure out 
how you know how we uh, how we live with it. You know, so um. social media is this big mess, but in that big mess, there are these smaller opportunities to do one thing really, really well. So I think that social media is a really great tool for sharing one's own experience and where it lands, it lands. And feedback, feedback is just to kind of take as almost, almost just for fun. So is your online life reflective of you? If we share more for ourselves than others, is that really sharing? Is that socializing? In the human economy, your value is not measured by likes, comments, or ratings, but rather the connections, experiences, mistakes, successes, failures, love, hate, and everything in between. Socializing is built into our DNA, and everyone does it differently. And through talking to each other and realizing the potentially negative effects of social media, we can work as a society on this new, interesting project of integrating our online lives with the ones we share with each other in real life. And by doing so, you can create a stronger, more confident you. I'm only human, can't you see? I made, I made a mistake. Please just look me in my face. Tell me everything's okay. Cause I got it.